Hey, what's up? Jason here from Unity3D.College. Today we're going to be rebuilding another interesting mobile game. It's a simple one where you click or tap the screen to chop these blocks and you just want to kind of time it and build up the blocks as high as you can, going higher and higher and smaller as you miss things until eventually you're terrible and you fail like that and the game ends and it's over. Now I'm not keeping track of a high score here, but we could add that in as well. So let's get started. So we're going to start this project off with a nice empty hierarchy and I'm going to just begin by creating a 3D object that's a cube and this is just going to be our center part. So remember in the game you can see this top down kind of forward view of the cube and I want my view to kind of actually match what the scene view is showing, not so much what the game view is showing here. So I'm going to grab the, well first let me make sure that cube's at zero zero. yep it is. Then I'll grab the main camera and kind of get it into position about where I want it, right around there. And I want to change it from perspective to orthographic and then maybe pull in that size just a bit and grab the Y value and just, oh not the, that's the rotation, the Y position, there we go, and just I just want to drag it up a tiny bit so that it's kind of right there. And now we're going to change the clear flags from skybox to solid color so we can just get that nice solid background. Next thing I want to do is create the cube that's going to come across. Remember we have a cube that comes that way and that comes that way. So we'll just do the same thing. We'll create another game object. Go to 3D object and choose cube. And we're going to adjust the size of this. First let's just kind of move it over here a little bit. Actually let's reset the position and then move it over here a little bit. And I want to set the scale here to 0.1 to get it nice and thin. And you can see here if I slide it over it's going to go right through the middle. I actually want to pull it up so that it's going to be right on top. And if my memory serves, 0.55 is the exact Y position that I want to use for this with a 1x1 one one cube and a 0.1 cube uh, on top of it. So there we go, we've got this cube and it can slide right, right, right across. So let's turn this into a prefab now. I'm just going to rename this, call it Moving Cube. And we'll go into our project view and we'll create a prefabs folder and drop this moving cube right into it. Right now it doesn't do anything, it's just a cube, but we're going to change that in just a moment. In fact, let's get started with that now. Let's go in and create a scripts folder right off of our root. And in here we'll create a new C sharp script. Call it moving cube. And then I'm going to open that up. And what we're going to do at first is just make this cube move straight along its forward direction. So we're going to begin with something pretty simple and then just start expanding on it just like we would in a real project. Alright here's our moving cube class and like I said we're going to keep it simple to start so we'll just say in our update we'll do transform.position plus equals transform.forward so just be whatever direction it's facing times time.delta time so that it's independent uh, the speed is independent of our frame rate and then we'll multiply that by move speed. And now we're going to need to generate a field for move speed. So hit control period and choose the generate field by picking enter. And it always gives us the wrong type here if we do this multiplication because it thinks it's a vector 3, but we really want to multiply by a float. So we're going to change that to float and set it to a 1 by default. Just that little f there. I'm clean up my formatting with control K, control D. And I'm going to get rid of this comment and the start. And I'm even going to write the word private right before update just so that it's all nicely cleanly lined up. There we go, I think we're good. I'm gonna save this off, jump back over to the editor, and then we'll attach the script, hit play, and it should be pretty exciting. Our cube will slowly move across the screen. There we go, let's hit play. We should see it just kinda go right along that blue axis. There we go, look at that. Exciting stuff, right? So we've got a cube moving. Now I want to, well, let's see. We have a couple options. We could either start building up the spawners that spawn these things, we could set up the game manager, or we could set it up to actually do the slicing of the cube. Um, I think I want to start with a simple game manager, and then we'll go to cube slicing, and then maybe the spawning. So let's just create a new C -sharp script, and I'm just going to call this game manager. And if you've seen my other videos about managers and controllers and stuff, you know that for this, I want it to be really small. I don't want to have 
a game manager that's doing a lot of things and running a big game. But since this is a tiny game and our entire game manager code is going to fit onto a single screen, I'm totally fine with just creating something simple that's called game manager. So in our game manager, here, let's get rid of start and all those comments, clean up that formatting again, we're going to control K, control D and get rid of that white space and mark that private. And then, um, by the way, it's private by default. I just like to add the word there, just keep it clean and consistent, um, just to have it personal preference. So in our update, we want to look to see when the player touches the screen or clicks or whatever. And then we want to actually call the code to make our cube stop, get sliced and spawn the next cube. So the first thing we'll do is just check to see if input dot get button down fire one is true. So at fire one. So this is going to be true whenever they, whatever it is a uh, control, left click, tap a screen, something like that. So whenever this happens, I want to stop the currently moving cube and have it slice itself up. Now I don't have a way to get the currently moving cube, but what I'm going to do here is actually just create something in the moving cube class. I'm going to make a public static moving cube, and I'm going to call this current cube. And I'll give it a private or a getter that's public. And I think I'll start with a private setter so that only this class can set the value of this. Now, since it's static, we don't have to have a reference to it. We just call moving cube dot current cube and it's going to get whatever the current cube is. Now, I want to set a current cube and uh, eventually I think we'll move this over to the spawner. But for now, we'll just do it in a wake here or let's do it in an on enable. So to go on enable and we're going to say current cube equals this. So whenever a new cube gets instantiated or actually it's whenever one gets enabled, the current cube will be set to that cube. So then we'll go back to the game manager and we can just say moving cube dot current cube dot stop. Uh, and stop doesn't exist. Let it hit escape and then add it. And I'm going to hit control period right here and generate that method and then F12 to go right into the method. So this is going to be the method that's responsible for stopping the cube and then chopping it up and making the little piece fall. So the first step here is obviously just to stop the thing, make it stop moving. So here we'll say move speed equals zero. And in fact, let's change this move speed into a serialized field so we can adjust it at runtime. So now we can adjust it at runtime and we are technically adjusting this value here, which I don't really like, but like I said, it's a small enough project. I don't think it's going to matter. If our move speed somehow gets broken, the entire game's not going to work. We'll know right away if we messed up and saved our move speed somehow in the editor. But we're not really doing that. We're just kind of stopping it. It's going to be fine. So step one, just stop the thing whenever we hit fire one. Pretty simple. Let's give that a try. So hit play. Just click and make sure that it works. By the way, I like to do this a lot just when I'm coding. Um, just run through stuff, add a little bit of functionality, and then test it. Oh, what didn't work. You know why? Because I didn't add a game manager game object. So here we'll create an empty game object, rename it game manager, and then add it on. And this is one of the many reasons that I like to just test along the way. Sometimes, oh, here, I'm actually out of habit about to save. So let's create a scenes folder. And in here, we'll just call this game. But anyway, like I was saying, um, I like to test it a lot because if I just keep coding and coding and coding and forget to test, a lot of the times when I go back to actually test it, I get stuck trying to figure out where I went wrong if something was broken, if it was too far back. So when I test it right away, I know that, hey, this thing worked and we're good. It's kind of like doing a, not really, but kind of like doing test-driven development where you, you, know, you code to your tests you run the tests and then you continue on to the next thing. Here it's just a bit more manual. All right, so let's get back in. And we've got our stopping happening. And I think the next step is just gonna be to slice the cube up. And this is really the kind of key part of this game. It's a lot of the functionality here is just, can we figure out how to slice this cube and make part of it fall down? Like there's really, not a whole lot more to this game. So this is gonna be a big chunk. So to cut this cube up, I need to figure out how far we've gone past the previous cube or how far before the previous cube we stopped. 
So I'm gonna call that the hangover value, just how far over we're hanging. And I'm just gonna make a float, I'll call it hangover. And we're gonna calculate this as the, what is it gonna be, the transform.position.z minus the last cube's z position. So we're gonna need to um, store our last cube. So say like last cube dot transform dot position dot z. Now last cube doesn't exist, but I'm just gonna copy this code right up here for current cube and paste, and we're gonna make a last cube. So whenever last cube is set, we'll get that. And I think to start off, our last cube is just gonna be the initial cube, this, uh, this block right here. So in fact, let's just go to our cube right here. I'm gonna rename this start, like our starting cube. And I'm gonna assign the moving cube script to it, but I'm gonna set that speed to zero. Oh, did it not assign? Let's try that again. Add that script, and we'll just set it to zero. So this, this thing's not really gonna move. I just want it there assigned as that transform position. So that way I don't have to write special code here to check to see if last cube is null or anything. And then, um, let's see, how do I wanna do that? I'll go on enable if last cube is null, uh, last cube equals this. So that way the first cube that spawns will automatically be the last cube, uh, whatever it's called, last cube. And then the ones after that will get assigned. Um, actually, no, let's, let's change this. I'm gonna do something somewhat bad and ugly that I don't really like, but I think it's gonna simplify the code a little bit. And we'll just do game object find. And we'll find the start object and get the component for moving cube. Now again, I wouldn't in a bigger project ever use gameobject.find just because it's string based and it causes problems all the time. People rename things, stuff breaks. You can't have more than one of a thing you know, and find it. So it, it causes a lot of problems. But in something as simple as this, we just wanna find that start cube and assign it the first time. I think we're, we're good, we don't have to worry about it. Just remember if you rename start, the entire game breaks. All right, so we've got the cube. We've got this one set up as our start cube. And then we have this one set up to move. And then when we stop, we're going to calculate out that hangover. And let's just log that value real quick. So we'll do debug.log of hangover. And then play and see what it looks like. So we play, we should get a value. Um, here, well, let's just take a look. So we stop right here. What do we get? Enable messages, we got a Four point or 0.477. So I expect if we stop on the other side to get a negative value. So remember it's this position minus that position only on the Z axis. Let's let it go again and we stop here and we got a negative 0.5. So that's about what I'm expecting. All right, now let's go back into our code again. And now we need to figure out how to actually chop this thing up. So we've got this hangover value. How do we split this cube? And what we're gonna do is actually just gonna resize the current cube and then just spawn a little throwaway cube to fall down and then kill that thing. So let's create another method here. Um, I'll get rid of the debug log and let's say, what do I call this? I'll call this split cube and we'll give it the hangover value. Actually, it's gonna be split cube on Z because eventually we're gonna need to split on the Z and the X axis. So I wanna be able to handle both. So we're just gonna make slightly separate methods because it's gonna be referencing a lot of like the position.z or scale.z and then back to x for the other one. So let's generate this method and get to implementing. The first thing I wanna do in here is calculate out the size of this new split cube. So remember we have this one cube and we're gonna split it into two. So just wanna get the size of both of those cubes. So I'm gonna say float new z size equals last cube dot transform dot local scale. This is just in case we end up putting this inside some other object, we wanna use that local scale. We'll use the z value and we're gonna subtract math f dot absolute. So we're gonna get the absolute value of the hangover here. So if it's negative, we'll get a positive value there. If it's positive, we'll get a positive value. So this is gonna give me the z size and then I wanna get the size of this block that's gonna fall off as well. So let's say float falling block size. 
equals transform dot local scale dot z minus new z size. So here we've, we're figuring out the size of this new, like the, the cube that's getting stacked, and then just subtracting the old size minus that new size to find the size of the piece that's getting chopped off. So if half of our block is getting stacked, exactly half of the block is falling off. So they'd both be exactly the same size. But I think you get the idea if we've got 75% staying on, 25% is gonna fall off. Now this might be a 0.75 and a 0.25. Uh, the next thing I wanna do is figure out the position. So where is this gonna spawn? So if we rescale this block down, we need to move it. In fact, let's just take a real quick look in the editor. Imagine that we went right here and we chopped it. So we chopped it at this point. I'm gonna move in the scene view too. There we go. So say we chopped it right here. If we left the position of this thing, so we scaled this, to, here, let's uh, put it right here. If we went, scaled this down to uh, 0.5 on the Z, right? So we shrunk it down. That's not gonna work, right? If we look at that, that value, look at, look at where the edge is. It's not in the right spot. So we need, we need our code to scale it down and move it over here and then spawn another block right there that's the correct size. Here, let's hit undo a couple times. I'll mess up that block and then let's go back to the code and set up the code to figure out that new Z position so to get this we'll say float new Z position and it, by the way I think it's important to use pretty descriptive names if you use generic crap like float Z equals something and I don't know if that's the position the scale whatever for the new object or the old one so make sure you use good names so we'll use last cube dot transform dot position dot z so this is the position the z position of that uh, cube underneath so this will be like the start which is going to be zero in this case oh well, at least for the first cube and then we're going to add the hangover value divided by two okay so that should get us right in the correct position but we need to also set our scale so we've figured out our new scale this new z size but we need to actually set it so let's say transform dot local scale equals a new vector three. And we're gonna use our transform dot local scale dot X because we don't want to change the X. We don't want to change the Y either. So we do transform dot local scale dot Y. And then we we'll use new Z size for the Z value. This is gonna rescale our transform down and then we'll put it in the correct position. For the position, we'll say transform dot position equals a new vector three. And again, we'll use transform.position.x, then transform.position.y, because we don't want to change either of those. And then we'll use our new z position. So if we save that off and we go back into the editor, we should be able to stop our cube right on top of there and have it kind of get chopped. There we go, look at that. It works perfect. Now let's go to the other side and see if that works as well. We'll go all the way across and see if it chops right there. There we go. So look at that, we've got a cube already chopping and placing. So we've got that part done. Let's go over and get the uh, falling part done now. Let's reopen our script. And um, well, to get the falling part, I wanna figure out where the edge is that we're using, if we're like all the way on one edge or the other. And then we're gonna spawn the block over there. And to do that, I think we'll just create a new cube, make it match the color or something, and then just drop it right down. So to do that, I'm gonna say float cube edge going to get us that edge position equals transform dot position dot z plus new size divided by two this will be half of that size of the the new size because we're going to get that edge position and then bounce out from there and then um i think that's it eventually we're going to need to pull in some directional stuff so that we can go x and z but i think we're okay without it for now and then uh, we want to calculate out that falling block position. So let's say float falling block Z position equals our cube edge plus the falling block Z size, falling block size. We should call it a Z size. Oh, we'll call it size. Uh, divided by two times, um, actually it's just divided by two. And then I think that's it. No, that's all we need to get that position. And then we need to actually do the spawning. So let's see, to spawn our cube, let's see, what, what do we wanna do? Let's call another method. Let's call spawn drop cube. 
And let's pass in that falling block Z position. I'm gonna kind of split this out. It is already getting a little bit long and spawning this little drop cube, I think is another thing that we need to do. It should be in a separate method. So first let's just create a cube. So say var cube equals game object dot create primitive. And if you've never used this before, it just creates a primitive type. So we can do any of the things that you could do in a new game object if you went to that 3D menu. And we'll pick cube. This is just gonna give us a game object that's a cube. And then, um, well, let's see. We want to figure out the scale of that cube and the position. So we'll say cube dot transform dot, I even have the scale right up there in falling block size, don't I? Local scale equals uh, new vector three. And we're gonna use transform dot local scale dot X. Because remember, we're, we're getting the X width of the object that the, of this cube. Whatever the width of, or the length of this dropping cube is, totally independent of the height and the, the depth, I guess, or the X and the Y of this. So we'll use a transform dot local scale dot Y. So this should match on both of those. And then we need to chop it. Um, what do we want to do here? I could pass that in or we can just subtract those scales. Yeah, let's just pass it in. So falling block size, may as well. We're already calculating it. Um, are we using it for the position? Um, I'm just trying to think. Like, see, It almost feels like both of these should probably be in here well actually I know why I don't want to move them both in here because I want to be able to do this in both directions um, I'll pass it in for now let's just do that so we'll pass in falling block size I'll call it float falling block size and then we'll use that as the Z for the local scale of this thing then we need to figure out the position and we already have that so we'll just let's copy paste and change this to position and then we'll do position and position and copy out the following block z position there so we just changed all of those scale references to position and we pass that in um so that should give us a cube in the right spot um let's save and see if we get a cube there so hit play let it go and chop and oh Kind of, not quite though, so let's try again. Let's, play, let's see what happens if we go over the edge. So if we go over the edge, we are good. So we got a cube, our main moving cube is chopped there, and then this one is right here, and it could fall right down. Let's try one more time at the before part and see what's going on there. So there you can see our new cube, the falling one is right there, and then this one got placed right there. So What's really happening is this should have been over there and it just got placed on the wrong side. So let's see why that happens. So to go through the process of debugging this, let's just do something simple here. I'm gonna show you, we can do a, so a game object, of oh, not game manager, game object dot create primitive. And then let's create it at the transform dot position dot X and transform dot position dot Y. And then cube edge for the Z. This is gonna show us where that calculated cube edge is. I'm gonna call this var sphere equals that. And then we'll say sphere, oh, this, sorry, I did that wrong. This is, uh, it takes a primitive type and I passed in the position. So primitive type, it's gonna be of dot sphere. And then we'll say sphere dot transform dot position equals new vector three and paste in those, those values. So I wanna, I get, a little bit confused there but anyway we're creating a primitive we're putting it at this position and then we're going to give it a scale so say sphere dot local or transform dot local scale equals and we'll do vector 3.1 times maybe like a 0.01 f so it's just a smaller sphere it's going to show us where this edge is being calculated and then i'll show you how to fix it so here we go I'll do it uh, first on the one where it works right and we'll see where that edge is. Let's see the sphere is right here 
if I turn off these uh, two cubes, you can see the edge is right there. That's where it calculated. So let's try again and let's stop it right here. Let's see what happens. And if we turn off both of these again, oops, I think I got some extra cubes. You see that the sphere is actually over here. Uh, well, the first sphere, here it is. This is the one that we were worried about. I clicked twice, so I got the second one. So it's over here. It's on the wrong side of the cube. If we look at the moving cube again, here, let's re-enable that. It's over here. It, it got put over here, and it's supposed to be on the other side. So let's stop. And the way that we're going to change this up is just by adding in some sense of knowing which side we stopped on or which uh, direction we want to push the thing out to. So I'm going to go right up. Let's see. Where are we calling split? Right here. I'm going to go right here and I'll say um, float direction equals. And here I'll say if hangover is greater than zero, it's going to be one. Otherwise, oh, whoops, I did that wrong. That's a question mark question mark 1f and then a colon negative 1f. So what's going to happen is if our hangover is greater than zero, we're going to get a value of one, which means we're going to push it over past the, the current z. So we're going to go over to where we already are. If it's less than one, we're going to go in the opposite direction and we're going to use that to move our edge and our edge piece over the opposite way. So here I'll just pass in direction and then we'll take that as a float. And then I can copy that direction and we'll just go down here. There are two places we're going to need it. One for calculating the cube edge. So we'll just multiply by direction here. So that's just going to make this value become negative if we're on the other side. So instead of adding the position, we're subtracting it. We could also have like an else statement here that adds and subtracts. But multiplying by one or negative one feels a little bit simpler to me. I, I could be wrong though. And then we'll do the same thing here on the position. So we're getting the edge and then we want to get the position. We also want to, uh, oh, need the little star there to multiply. We also want to move it the other way. So let's try that. And here, I'm going to get rid of this sphere code. Just delete that right out and hit play again. We should get it splitting correctly on both sides. There we go. Look at that. We've got a cube right here and we have our main cube right there. Perfect. So let's see. Let's go on to the next step and just make that cube split kind of fall down so we have this drop cube so to make it fall we could we could be spawning a prefab and putting it all there but this is a pretty simple game and a pretty simple project so I think what we'll do is just say cube dot add component rigid body and save and then let's make it destroy the cube too so let's say destroy cube dot game object very important that we do the dot game object um, and then give it a time so one f so it's going to destroy that game object after one second. So I have the cube fall. By the time it's off the screen, it gets destroyed. And if you don't do the dot game object here, it's going to just remove. Um, well, actually here, it, it is a game object. It's not going to matter at all. I'm so used to doing this with scripts. We could do cube, but we just do game object out of habit to make sure. Because sometimes if you do it with a script and it's uh, not the game object that you're referencing, you'll end up just removing the script from the object and not destroying the thing. Okay, so let's play and see if our little cube falls down. I'll go to the end right here. Go, bam, falls right down, goes tumbling. You may have noticed it went kind of rolling around. Uh, the reason for that is we have colliders on our cube and our start. So I'm going to actually turn those off. So I'm just going to uncheck the box collider, uncheck the box collider there, and save. And now it should just kind of fall straight down. There's nothing for it to interact with. And we don't need colliders here. We don't need anything for it to interact with. That's exactly the behavior we want. Let's try it once on the other side. And perfect. Now before we go spawning other cubes, I want to add a little bit of color here. So I'm going to go back into that moving script. And I think I'll just do it right in on enable. And we're just going to set the color of this thing to a random color and then make that little falling cube a match as well. So here I'll just say get component renderer dot material dot color because these are really simple objects that have a single solid color equals and I'm just gonna call this a get random color we're gonna make a new method here you know hit control period and generate that method and then we need to return back a random color so to do that we'll say return new color and we're gonna go unity engine dot random dot range 0 comma 1 F and make sure you have the F there otherwise you're gonna end up with all zeros or all ones and it's gonna be a black and white grayish mess 
they want to have that F right in there. And I'm going to just copy that. Unity engine dot random dot range zero to one and paste it two more times with commas in between. And now we have a random color. If you want to pick like a set number of colors or set thing of colors, you know, always do like an array with an editor and then have it randomly pick one of those or cycle through them or something. But I think a random color is perfectly fine. Then I'm going to copy this, this get component renderer color part because I want to do that in the uh, spawn drop cube. I want to do it right down here. We're going to paste and say cube.getComponent.Renderer.Material.Color equals, and I'm going to copy that again. There. So here we're just getting our current color and we're setting it on the other one. Now, ideally, you probably don't want to be calling get component renderer over and over. For this, I really don't think it matters. We're not doing it often. You know, we're doing it maybe, what, 20, 30 times in the game before the player loses. Not going to matter at all. Zero performance problems there. Um, like I said, you don't want to call get component all the time. You don't want to call add component all the time. But for this, yeah, don't waste your time trying to optimize that. So let's see, let's see how that works. Let's hit play and we should get some random color cubes. There we go, look at that. And we chop it and it falls perfect. And notice that the start cube is changing randomly too. That's because we're using the moving cube script on there. There we go, bam, look at that, beautiful. Now that we have one cube splitting and breaking apart, let's uh, set up our spawner so that we can actually spawn multiple cubes and just have them keep chopping off. So to do that, let's take our moving cube. I'm going to create an empty game object under there and just pull it out. And I'm going to rename that spawner. And I'll name it spawner Z. This is the one that's going to get chopped on the Z axis. And then let's see, I think I want to create a script. So we'll go ahead and create a new C sharp script. Let's call this cube spawner. And then we'll assign that to spawner Z before we open it up. There we go. Just attach up oh, there. I can select things right, attach that right there, and then open it. That's just so I don't run it again later and forget that, you know, like, hey, why didn't this work? Okay, so we don't need a start or an update, I don't think. Um, we do need a reference to a prefab, though. So let's add a private moving cube. I'll call this cube prefab. And we're going to add the serialized field attribute so it shows up in the editor. And then I want to add a public method called public void uh, spawn cube. So to do that, we'll say bar cube equals instantiate cube prefab. And then the position for this is going to be our position. So we'll say cube.transform.position equals, well, let's see, a new vector three. And we're going to use transform.position.x. Transform, uh, let's go new line. And we'll say, well, for our Y, what do we want to use? We really want to use the position of the last cube that was spawned plus 0.1 or whatever the height of that cube is. So I'm going to say moving cube dot last cube dot position or dot transform dot position dot Y plus. And then here I could do something like 0.1 or I could just do... Um, See, what would I use? I'd use the prefab. So you use like the cube prefab dot transform dot local scale dot y. So here we're gonna move it up by 0.1 or whatever the size of that prefab is. And not hard coding it is a little bit better because then if we adjust the size of this, it'll still work. We don't have to go in and change the code. And then for the z, we'll just use transform dot position. Whoops. Dot position dot z. And get rid of that. So this is gonna give us the correct position. It's essentially just moving the cube to line up with us and raising it up above whatever the, the previous cube was at. Let's see, um, what else do we need in here? Is there anything else? I don't think so, I think that's it. Uh, let's add a gizmo drawing though. Let's say uh, on draw gizmos, and I'm gonna say gizmos.color equals color.green. And here we'll do gizmos.drawwirecube. We'll do it at our transform dot position plus or not plus comma vector three dot. Uh, actually, no. Let's use trans uh, cube transform or cube prefab dot transform dot local scale. So that way, the size of it matches our prefab and the position matches uh, where this thing is because our cube spawner doesn't have a model on it. We just want to be able to see it in the editor. 
and adding an on draw gizmo is a really simple way to do that. So let's see, let's save that off and then come back over here to our spawner and we should start to see a green box around it. Uh, let's apply the prefab for the moving cube. Remember we created the prefab in the prefabs folder. Just wanna apply it, make sure that everything matches and then I'm gonna disable it. And, oh, we have an error message. What's the error? Is that clear? Oh, okay. So if we look at our spawner, our cube prefab isn't assigned. So our on draw gizmos is throwing an error. So here we go. I've got the spawner selected. We'll go to project view and just assign the moving cube. And suddenly our gizmos are working. So now we see where it's going to spawn them. I'm going to save my scene. And then we'll go back to that game manager. We're going to now tell the game manager to have the the spawner uh, actually do the spawning. So when we stop it, we'll call current cube dot stop and then we will um, spawn a new cube. So here let's say find object type cube spawner dot spawn cube. And for this beginning part, we may not have a current cube anymore. So I'm gonna hit copy right there and I'll say if that is not equal to null then stop it. So our first time through, we're not gonna have a moving cube. It's gonna spawn that first cube. Now let's play and see how that looks. And we are gonna get a couple errors. It's fine, let's watch. And look, our cube is kind of working. You can see it's getting bigger and bigger. It's also starting right in the middle. Um, let's take a look at the code one more time in our spawner. So remember right here, we're checking to see if last cube's not null and then doing this. But last cube is uh, set to our start cube as well. So if the last cube is our start cube, it's not really gonna work because it's gonna go right in the middle. And we really only wanna do this for if, it, if we have a current cube or if our cube is not the start cube, really. So we can instead just do something like uh, if last cube is not null and moving cube dot last cube is not equal to game object dot find. And again, I really hate using this but uh we're gonna do it anyway that get component and it's a uh, moving cube or here actually let's do uh, let's just compare the game objects so check the last cube game object versus the game object for start so that way this only happens on non-start cubes and realistically a cleaner way would probably be to stop using the moving cube script for the start one but then we need to refactor the other code and I don't really feel like doing that. But you can see the positions are right now. But also, look at these cubes. They're still huge. Why are they always big? They should be shrinking down. So let's change that as well. Let's go back into our moving cube script. And then we can do this probably just in the on enable. Let's just change our scale here. So say transform.local scale. And we're going to set it to, um, actually, yeah, just our last cube's local scale, right? So say last cube dot transform dot local scale. So this would be whatever the cube that was chopped. We're gonna just gonna copy its scale. So let's try that. To play. Yeah, we come in. Oh wait. Let's not do just that because we just copied the uh, the giant starting cube again. This is another one of those problems with that that large starting cube. So here we'll do new vector three and we'll do the x. Um, and then comma y, but we'll get rid of the last cube. So we'll just use our own y value. There we go. Make sure you change the, the y. And then we'll change the, put the z for the last cube. So we'll copy the x and z. We'll keep our y. Now I'm convinced if I was doing this as a bigger project, this would not be a moving cube. There we go. We chop it. And look, our blocks are getting smaller and smaller. We can stack them and they fall. But if I click way out here on nothing, we don't lose yet, so let's change that as well. Let's go into our moving cube, and then I think right here in our hangover code, we could do a check to see if we're too far over, and if we are, we'll just end the game and maybe reload the scene. To kill our player, we could just do it right here. So right when we stop, if the hangover is too large, I think that's enough to just know that game's over. So let's say if the math f dot absolute, which just remember gets the absolute value, so if it's negative, it'll become positive, of hangover is greater than or equal to, oops, that in the right position, the last cube dot transform dot local scale dot z, oh, not local angle, uh, local scale dot z. So if it's, uh, 
if our hangover is further than that that width or the the length of the thing, then we're off the edge. So to end it, we'll just set last cube to null. We want to clear that out. Um, probably set current cube to null too. Let's do that. And then just call scene manager manager. There we go. And I need to add a using statement. So control period and then enter dot load scene and just pass in zero to reload our scene. Now remember we need to reset last cube and current cube because these are static so they're not gonna get reset when we reload. They're just gonna stay there. So we'd have references to objects that were created. They'd blow up and we'd just get exceptions and errors and we don't want that. So we just clear that out. Okay, let's jump back in one more time and see if the game just reloads when we totally miss. So here, let's just do it right here. Bam, I missed and reloaded. Okay, let's chop 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 and i'll be a little slow there we go and it reloaded again we do have some errors here we can deal with those in a minute just want to make sure that everything is actually working though and our objects are chopping and counting up i think we're God, this is it's looking pretty good so far right we've got most of the functionality there we're going to need to add in coming from the other side but that's not going to be too hard and then some scorekeeping okay so let's stop this right now Let's get our other spawner working now. So I'm gonna select the Z spawner and just kind of move up here and I'll duplicate it. Control D and rename it to spawner X. And then I'm just gonna hold control and drag it. And then, uh, actually here, let's uh, set that to zero. And then I'll drag it over this way and just get it kind of in position. So the, this is gonna be the cubes coming from here. So we'll have them coming from there and from there. And I'm gonna open up that cube spawner script and I need a way to determine um, which direction they're coming from. And that's because we're using different scales and we're gonna chop from X versus Z. So I'm gonna add a move direction. And to do that, here, let's just go to the bottom of this class. I'm gonna add a public enum move direction. And we're just gonna give it two values, uh, X and Z. I'll save that and I'm just gonna select it and hit control period. To move that to its own file. So now we've got a move direction enum in its own file. And here we'll add a serialized field and we use a private move direction, move direction. So what I want to do is when I spawn a cube, I want it to take the move direction from the spawner. So the spawner is just going to tell it what its move direction is. So here we'll say cube.move direction equals move direction. Now this doesn't exist, so we'll hit control period and generate a property, then hit F12 to go to it. So now we have this move direction property, it can be set. It, internal just means it's like public, but it can't be set from something outside the DLL. It's as close to public as it could be. It, we could also just get rid of that and make it public. It's not gonna make a difference either way. So we've got a move direction here, and we're gonna need to take advantage of that. So let's just start by making it move in the correct direction. So let's go down to update. So for our update, if our move direction is Z, this is perfect, right? So say if uh, move direction equals dot Z, then we want to move into the forward position. And then I'm gonna say else, since we only have two options, we know that it's in X, we'll move, we're gonna copy and paste this, but we're not gonna move forward, we're gonna move to the right. Let's, let's see how that works. So I've got this spawner X. We should get a move direction drop down in just a moment when the compiling finishes. Okay, that one's set to X and spawner Z needs to change over to Z. And I'm going to disable spawner Z for just a moment and just hit play. There we go. And look at that, it goes in the correct direction. Now, things aren't working, right? It's not chopping, right? But that's just because we need to adjust our code to handle this new direction. But I want to make sure that it's moving right and that we're passing that direction right. And if we hit play again, we should just get them from Z and they'll be going in the correct direction from Z. Oh, maybe if I disable um, X. That's one problem with the uh, find object type. You can't really control which one it's gonna find. It's gonna find one and it could be the first one, it could be something else. Okay, that's still working though. Okay, so let's go back into our spawner X and re-enable that. And then I wanna make it start using both of these spawners. So before we fix up the, the slicing from the other direction, let's just make it, um, oh, actually no, let's fix the slicing first. I said that, but I thought about it and I think getting the slicing working on the other one is, is a little bit easier if we only have the one. So I'm gonna disable spawner Z. 
save my scene, and then let's go back into our moving cube code. Okay, so here we're doing a split on Z, but we only want to do that if we're in the Z move direction. So I'm going to add an if statement here. So if move direction is equal to Z, then do this, else, and then I want to do something different. We're going to just kind of copy this method and I'll paste it right above because X comes before Z. We're going to change that to an X. And I'm going to copy this call and paste it right here, but change that to an X as well. And what we're going to do is just kind of refactor, re change this code up to use the X value instead of the Z. Now generally I don't like copying and pasting stuff. In this case I don't think it's, uh, I don't think it matters and I think it's a little bit more complicated to change that up and abstract it away. Here we can just replace the references to Z with X and replace the way that we do our, um, our new vector threes. So here change that Z, that Z, that Z. Uh, first, I'll just go through and change all the Z's to X's. And I'm going to rename these as well. So we're going to go through and rename anything that has a Z in the name to an X. I'm going to make sure this is nice and clean. No reason to leave it sloppy. Okay, so that's all good. Now we need to adjust this part right here. So we're changing the, um, the local scale. We don't want to change the Z size to that. We want to change the X size. So I'm going to cut that, move it over here, comma. And then I'll just change that to a Y and a Z and close it up. And then we'll do the same for the position. So we'll just move this position. I can even grab it and drag it, by the way. And then add a comma and then just change that because it goes Y, Z. There we go. And now we have a method to handle it for our X. But our drop cube, no, our drop cube isn't that smart. Our drop cube is also looking at... Um, or it's also creating these vector threes and putting these values in and we want to do this again for the the x instead of the z if we're in that move direction but here i'll just add an if statement so we'll say if move direction is equal to z then we'll do these two lines and then else we'll just do two lines for x just copy those two down paste them and we'll grab that drag it over again add the comma and go to the end can you, oh, change that to Z and Y and then again just double click and again drag drop comma change to a Y and change to a Z and now we support going both directions it's all there was to it so let's try that let's hit play and our cube should come this way and just kind of chop oh we have an error here let's see Let's take a look. So all of our cubes are perfectly sized. Let's see what's causing that. Now to track down this bug, we're going to do a little bit of debugging. So here I am in Visual Studio, and we're going to go into the split cube on X, and right here to the left of the line number, I'm just going to click and add that little red dot. That's just a breakpoint. Then I can hit Attach to Unity, or F5 is the default key. If you're in Mono Develop, you can do this as well. Um, hotkeys are about the same and you click in very similar areas. So there we go, we're attached. And now I'm gonna go back in and hit play. And let's see what's happening. Let's see why that position is wrong. There we go, so we spawn a cube. Uh, this one I'm just gonna hit F5 and let it go. And then I'll let it go all the way past even. Let's click. And right here, I think you can see, I have a little extension that puts uh, the variable values above them so you can kind of see them already. But if you mouse over, you notice that hangover is zero. So why is hangover zero? Right? We're definitely way over the edge. Now let's go back um, and look at our code again. So where does hangover get calculated? Hangover is right here. So we look at the Z position minus the Z position of the previous one. Now does it, it hopefully it clicks what the issue is here, but if not, Let's just go through it. The Z position, well, let's just stop debugging. And let's look in here, let's pause. The Z position here is zero. That one's zero. That one's zero. Because remember, we're changing on the X here. So we need our code to be smart enough to know the direction is the X direction, and then figure out the hangover from the X direction. So here, since this is gonna be a little bit, tiny bit more complicated, I'm gonna select that line of code or that section of code from beginning of transform to right before the semicolon and hit control period 
And then I'm going to go down and pick the extract method. Actually hit up arrow instead of going down twice and hit enter. And I'll call that, oh, look at that. It already automatically named it git hangover. So just hit enter and hit F12 to go to the method. And here I'll just check if move direction is equal to Z. I'll return that and then we'll copy that and say else and paste and we'll just replace this with X's as well. So now if we jump back over and play one more time, we should get the chopping just right. Chop, chop, fail, fail. Oh no, oh we have one error there. So we're missing it in one spot. Let's see what happens if we go off the other edge. Okay, chop, chop, and what if I click way over there? Okay, so we do have one more issue here where, let's see if I can get it to happen, okay. So we are spawning bigger ones, and uh, I think this is gonna be another similar issue. So let's take a look. So let's do a quick check right here and I think you might see what's going on. Again, we're only checking the Z value, and if we're going in the X direction, that's not gonna work. So we need to add in a check here. So it's gonna be, here, let's say, float max equals, and here we'll go move direction equals Z, question mark, and we'll use the Z value. So if the move direction is Z, max is gonna be that Z right there. And then else, so the colon is going to be, if it's not that, if this is not true, then we'll set it to X. So now we're going to get the X or the Z depending on the move direction. And then copy that and we'll do that in our if statement here. So now we're checking against the correct direction. And it should work again. So this is just like before when we weren't ending the game on a fail. Things get a little wonky and we get big, uh, big cubes spawning. There we go. So now if I click off, I get a bad one. Perfect. You may also notice that little slice. That's just this first cube getting a little bit confused. A little rounding error on the floats. Nothing to worry about. We could stop that, but I don't really care. So let's see. We've got that working. We've got the cubes coming from both directions. Um, now let's make it actually alternate. So I'm going to re-enable this Z spawner. And we'll go into the game manager. And... Um, Right here, I think I just wanna, instead of finding a cube spawner every time, I'm gonna find all of the cube spawners or both of them, and then we'll just go through both of them. So let's add an awake. And here I'll say spawners equals find objects of type, and we want the plural one, find objects of type, cube spawner. And I'll hit control period to generate a field for that. And then here, I just wanna pick the new current spawner. So I'm gonna say current spawner, equals and then we'll go spawners at uh, let's call it spawner index and we don't have a spawner index so let's generate a field for that it should give us an integer and then I'll generate a field for our current spawner as well give us some of this extra space I just added and then for our spawner index it's going to be equal to the opposite of what it was previously so we'll say spawner index equals and they'll say spawner index double equals zero, question mark one, colon zero. So here we're just kind of flipping between the two. Oh, I need a semicolon. We're flipping between the two. So first time through, we click. It's gonna say, hey, spawner index is zero. So we're gonna change it to one. Next time through, it's not gonna be equal to zero. So it's gonna change to zero. And just gonna kind of flip back and forth. And then, um, yeah, maybe, oh, I don't wanna do it right there, right here. Yeah, right here, we'll just say current spawner, dot spawn cube. So now we should be alternating between the two spawners. Let's try that out. Go back in, hit play one more time. And there we go, we get a cube coming this way, and a cube coming that way, and a cube coming this way, and a cube coming that way, and that way. And you see, we're almost there. We're stacking up. The only problem now is that our positions are not quite right. We're getting the right size, but we want these to stack up um, in a set spot. We don't want this little weird overlap going on. So let's change that. And I believe we're gonna do that in our moving cube. We're just gonna make it spawn at the correct scale. So let's see, where are we doing our scale? Right here. So we're doing last cube dot transform dot X and Y, oh, okay. So we've got the scale right. We just need to fix that position. I don't know why I said scale when I meant position. So let's take a look. That is actually in our cube spawner where we spawn these. 
So here we're doing it at transform.position.x and transform.position.z. And this needs to be a little bit more intelligent because we want to keep um, the current either z or x depending on which one it is. And then we want to replace it with uh, the other one on the opposite. I don't know if that made any sense at all. Hopefully this code makes a little bit more sense. So let's just get to writing. Here, let's create two floats. We'll do a float x equals, and then we're set to move direction, double equals x. So if our move direction is x, we want to use transform.position.x. So we want to use our x position. Otherwise, we're going to use our moving cube.lastcube.transform.position.x. So if we're on the, the z one, we just want to copy the x position from the x spawner. And then we're gonna do the inverse on the Z spawner. So here, we'll copy that and we'll make a Z. Just replace all these instances of X with Z. And then here we can just pass in X and Z. So now we're calculating out the correct X and Z values. Let's go back in and play one more time. I think after this, we're just about done. Just adding some, some score. There we go, we chop it, we chop it chop it let's go maybe do a little overhang chop yep chop and fail perfect so you can see everything is just kind of working uh the last thing i want to do is just add in a score um to do that i always use text mesh pro so i'm going to go to window and package manager if you're in a newer version of unity 2018 i think it's point one and beyond has the package manager version of text mesh pro so open up the packages window go to all and then scroll down and pick text mesh pro oh i actually already have it installed um, if you don't then go ahead and do the install for it and then it's going to pop up and ask to do the um let's see let's see if it pops up again go to ui text mesh pro text yep it should pop up and ask you to do the import for the resources and just import that as well it's just some stuff that has to be in the assets folder there we go stop that and now we've got a text right here I'm gonna select the rec transform tool and I wanna do a stretch along the top, so hold Alt and Shift, select that. And then I wanna center my text right here and I'm just gonna say click to play. And then I want one more script that's a UI score script. So let's create a new C Sharp script and I'm gonna call this um, score text. So I'm gonna rename this object. Let's rename it to text mesh pro text. Nope, you're now, there we go, score text. We'll assign that script. And once it's on there, let's collapse that. Let's try getting that on there again. There we go. And then we'll open it up. And in here, um, let's see, I don't want to do anything in update. I want to clean up that formatting. And I'm going to add the word private here, just out of habit. What I want to do is just register for something in the game manager. So I'll say like a game manager dot on cube spawned and I don't have an event for this yet so I'm gonna copy that go over to the game manager I'm gonna add a public static event action and we add a using statement for action to add that using system and it's gonna be called on cube spawn I'm gonna assign it an empty delegate uh, this is just out of habit really don't need to do that but it stops no reference exceptions and it's just a big habit of mine I always do that so we've got an event here that's static that we can register for. And I'm gonna right after update, um, after we spawn the cube and update, I'm just gonna call on cube spawn. And again, this is why I designed that empty delegate, just so I don't have to do a null check there. It doesn't really matter, you could do it the other way, but have it. So here we've got this on cube spawn now, I'm gonna do plus equals and hit tab, and then hit enter. So it's gonna call whenever a cube is spawned. And here I'll just increment my score. So there's score plus plus, and I'll generate a field for that. It's gonna know it's an integer. I added the plus plus there. And then I'll say, um, oh, let's let's cache our text mesh pro text. Let's say text equals get component and tm pro dot ugu. We gotta find the ugui one. And then I'll generate a field for that. And then right here, we'll just say text.text .text equals score, colon, space, and then plus score. So that's going to set our score. Now, there's one important thing we need to do here. We need to add an on destroy. And here, I need to copy line 14, paste it down here, and add a minus. 
Oops, not a star, a minus. And that's just so that when this level reloads, we don't double register for this event. It wouldn't matter. Well, it would kind of matter because our score would be getting updated multiple times. So our score would keep going. Actually, no, we'd get no reference exceptions because this score text object would be destroyed. On cube spawn would trigger and it would try to call into a method on a destroyed object and we'd get a no reference exception. So we want to make sure that we clear that out. And then I'm going to remove those using statements in that space at the end. Let's go back in one more time, hit play, and I think our game is done. There we go. So we spawn, we play, slice, slice, slice. You can see my score going up nice and pretty. And I'll lose and it resets. Now there's one little bug there with that little falling slice thing. Uh, if you're working on this, I'd recommend going through and fixing it. I have it fixed in mind, but I don't want to show that. I, I think that it's an interesting thing for people to figure out. There we go. So it's not a perfect clone, but it's pretty pretty damn close, and uh, everything just works. We've got a game working here, um, and it's a fun one to play. I, I like building these simple little mobile games because they're fun, easy to pick up and just play. You can tap them, and you, know, you can also build these things in an hour or two or three or you know a day at most you know getting the the basic gameplay working so if you like this kind of uh, tutorial or this video uh, please just let me know drop a comment below and I'll keep doing these I plan on doing these semi regularly just going through these these little games and building them out I'm also gonna put the uh, the full project source up on the patreon account I've never done this before but I give it a try so if you're you know, even at the $1 level, you'd be able to just grab it and download the whole thing if you just feel like doing that instead of typing it. I highly recommend that you go through the process of actually building it, though. Don't just grab it and download it and play with it. You won't learn as much that way. So try try building it yourself first. Anyway, thanks for watching. Uh, don't forget to like, subscribe, hit bells, and share it with all your friends. And uh, that's it. Thanks again.